Um, I want to talk now about uh, historical linguistics and uh, the role they played in my career and some thoughts about um, the right way and the wrong way to do historical linguistics or the right way and the wrong way to look at it. Historical linguistics, like any historical enterprise, including uh, political history or social history or what have you, has to focus ultimately on the issue whether um, whether the transmission of languages or social structures across time is basically um, revolutionary or basically conservative. Now, um, the, ish the difficulty in making that decision is that one way of, one form of conservatism is keeping the basic underlying structure going while changing all the details so that the surface is changing but the, uh, the underlying substance is not. This is what makes uh, historical linguistics ultimately, uh, uh, I think, a, an, an interesting issue. Is, is, do we change for the sake of change? Is change constantly occurring on, on its own? Is it, is it driven by some external uh, propulsion? Or is it just a lot of reshuffling of the cards so that you end up with the same hand at the, at the end of the day? All right, I was an undergraduate at Harvard in 1967 to 71. Um, I had the very good fortune of being among uh, uh, some very good historical linguists there, including um, Calvert Watkins, who was probably the dominant uh, Indo-Europeanist of his, of his era, including Frank Cross, um, a, uh, a specialist in Northwest Semitic languages, uh, including Torkild Jakobsen, a famous Assyriologist, uh, and also uh, Einar Haugen, uh, a famous uh, Norwegian linguist with a lot of interests in um, language contact and heritage languages and language politics and things of that sort. In addition, there were uh, junior faculty members who were very helpful to me, uh, including uh, Anthony Arlato. So it was an environment where there was a lot of interest in historical linguist linguistics. Uh, there was also uh, some interest in American Indian languages there. Uh, there was, uh, in particular, there were people there working on Algonquian languages and re languages related to Algonquian, uh, including Carl Teeter and Ives Goddard. So there was a circle of people. And uh, although I never really got into those particular languages or language families very deeply, I absorbed a lot from that uh, environment and uh, it, had a, it had a lot of uh, influence on my thinking about language in general and not just about uh, processes of, of historical change. In a nutshell, my, uh, as my career has evolved, my emphasis in historical linguistics has been on cycles of disruption and repair. Now, by disruption, I usually mean some kind of phonological changes that are disruptive to the, uh, to the morphology. And I will say that most of the languages I've worked on are languages with fairly rich, and in some cases extremely rich, morphology, so that keeping the system going is no easy matter when there are disruptive forces at work. Now, the disruptions themselves are somewhat interesting. Uh, perhaps the least interesting or the, the most obvious is just simple phonetic attrition of the sort that frequently happens um, at the end of words where the final vowel or the final consonant or even the final syllable gets uh, reduced or deleted. Or things like syncope, which does pretty much the same thing immediately in words of three or more syllables. So just simple phonetic attrition, which is, um, uh, it just, it, it happens, it's the the normal course of events over time uh, for, uh, for phonological systems. Now, I became interested in one particular type of phonological shift, not necessarily, um, um, not necessarily destructive, 
but more in terms of, of shifting features. I became interested in uh, the idea that the, um, the vowel cycles that people have talked about going back to the, uh, the English vowel shift, the great vowel shift, and also the various uh, cyclical phenomena that uh, uh, Bill LeBove and others have described for English dialects. I became interested in the idea that one driving factor in that is a, a pull toward the sound, the vowel E, written with, uh, with the letter I in usually in uh, IPA, but E as the sound, and that the movements of the type A to A to A to E were pull chains. As there was something pulling people or certain types of people to that. And uh, I, I connected that with, uh, with uh, John O'Hala, a phonetician, his work on uh, frequency code and on the idea that uh, the, the, the vowel E, because of its high uh, second formant and its second formant uh, interacts with the third formant, and so you get a kind of a, what, what is perceived often as a high-pitched vowel, even if it isn't really high-pitched. And that that fed into the uh, uh, the the business about um, about uh, uh, about uh, daintiness or lack of, of, of threat of things that are high pitched and therefore uh, can be presumed to be small and inoffensive as opposed to darker heavier uh, vowels like aw, which um, we would associated in the other direction it's, it's, it, that, that are perceived to some degree as having lower pitches and coming from larger um, larger creatures than the ones that, uh, that, that have vowels like E. So I became interested in that as a, as a way of, of accounting for the as one of the drivers of um, these cyclical changes. Now for that to work you have to kind of uh, get into uh, delicate territory because the uh, the social linguistics of those things is uh, uh, is often described as being very gender uh, specific, uh, with uh, women moving in one direction and men either moving nowhere or moving occasionally in the in the other direction, and there was a lot of evidence for that. Uh, not that that's the that gender as such is the real um, uh, the real phenomenon in question. It's m much more of a psychological thing or a or uh, uh, what you might call femininity and masculinity as symbolic patterns. But uh, anyway, it did seem, there did seem to be considerable evidence that this was going on. So that's one disruptive effect. And I, I did a paper with uh, Matt Gordon, uh, the social linguist Matt Gordon, who's now at University of Missouri on that in uh, current anthropology. Another type of, uh, in addition to just regular attrition, and this type of social linguistically motivated or socio phonetically motivated uh, shift, uh, all of which can disrupt by neutralizing, by merging vowels and so forth. In addition to that, there's substratum effects in the course of language shift. So typically, uh, you've got a substratum, they've got their language with their prosodic and phonological patterns, and another language comes in, sweeps over. And in a, in, a, in a certain number of generations, everybody switched to the to the new language, the target language, but they uh, keep the the prosodic and phonological patterns of the original substratum language. So this would be your your rapid spread of languages like uh, Indo-European, which end up being pronounced radic in radically different ways in different parts of the world, depending on what the substrata were. Romance languages, which are very different in uh, for example, pronounced very differently in France and in the Iberian Peninsula and in Romania because of the languages, the substrata languages, or even adstrata languages. So the idea of language contact that ha that has phonological effects, all of these can disrupt morphology. Uh, and a very good example of the the, the latter is um, old the oldest dialects of Moroccan Arabic which I am convinced were um, lost their vowel length uh, distinction under the influence of a, of a substratum, which was none other than Latin, none other than late Latin, as, as still spoken into the, 
into uh, perhaps the 8th century in, uh, in the northern areas of, of Morocco. So there are disruptive effects, uh, most of which don't have anything to do with function. Uh, they don't care about function. They don't care about uh, what disruptions they, they cause in the morphology. But once they happen, the morphology uh, has to uh, patch itself up, has to keep going. And so how does that happen? Well, uh, I have to go back to my uh, undergraduate days at, at Harvard, where my specialty, uh, my own specialty, was uto aztecan languages. Now, uh, the Boston area is not terribly uh, well known for uh, as, a con as a location where you're going to get lots of Hopi and, and uh, and uh, Shoshone or Aztec people going through. Uh, so my work was entirely um, uh, from books. Fortunately, in, uh, Uto Aztecan is blessed with a very long tradition of excellent uh, descriptive uh, grammars, going back to Edward Spear and even beyond that to uh, some of the great uh, uh, Mexican uh, Spanish linguists of the post-colonial period. And uh, people like Benjamin Lee Wharf and uh, Sidney Lamb and a lot of other people have worked on uh, individual uh, Uto Aztecan languages. So there's a, there is a very good literature on uh, on many of them. But with the exception of the very early work by Edward Sapir on the historical linguistics, which is which was based on on a very limited amount of data, um, there hasn't been very much good historical work on Uto Aztecan. And so I, I had an opportunity to, to do that. And I, uh, I wrote a very long uh, undergraduate honors thesis, several hundred pages, although that was with very large letters and generous margins and generous line spacing, so probably would have been much more than 150 pages nowadays. But it was, um, it was my first major work in historical linguistics. Now, it was about verbal morphology and verbal morphophonemics, and it was, I think, competent, but not theoretically very exciting. But later on, I became, I went back to Utah Aztecan, and it was from the point of view of what, how repair functions when you have, um, when you have attrition or other processes that are, uh, that are making the, the incumbent or inherited morphology uh, uh, putting it on the edge of, of, of extinction. So typically when you have suffixes that are down to one consonant because the vowel has been attrited. And so I was interested in the process of how that how those things are renewed. And I, uh, I showed that, uh, or I tried to show, that in several cases what had happened was that they kept the word form with the, you know, the suffix uh, at the end being attrited, and what they did is they brought in another morpheme, such as a verb, that was hanging around out there, uh, and they brought that in. Uh, the connection being that the verb began with the same consonant as the, what the, the, the uh, endangered suffix that was still there, but just barely hanging on. Uh, in the form of a single consonant. You brought it in, so what you were doing was you were saving the morphology by bulking up in the, in the suffix, phonologically bulking up where it was in the process of disappearing. It hadn't quite disappeared, but was on the, on the verge of disappearing. Now I called those hermit crab restructurings, and I found some other examples of that. Um, um, I'm actually inclined to think that the, the uh, uh, the Germanic uh, dental preterites are, are have a uh, the the development of that in Gothic. I think is the same kind of process where you have you have a suffix and you have a verb out here and they get they get connected so that the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the larger uh, paradigm brings in uh, a verb form in the in the form of a suffix. Well, anyway. That was that was one form of repair where the uh, the key is that the the suffix and the independently occurring stem uh, begin with the same segment in general with the consonant. So there's a link 
not, not necessarily very close link in the meaning, uh, but a, uh, a, a, a phonological connecting thread that facilitates that, uh, that merger. Now this is in, in opposition to models where uh, you, when you see a, a suffix that looks like a verb, that you can identify with a verb, you assume that there was a, an original construction uh, with a one verb here and another verb here, perhaps a subordinated verb or an infinitive or something, and then you have a gradual process of grammaticalization where this gets squashed into from syntax into morphology, the kind of thing that the grammaticalization theorists talk about. So I was arguing for a different process, a more abrupt one, where you uh, you you repair an existing structure rather than jettisoning it and allowing a new structure to come in from the syntax and become gradually grammaticalized. Another example of this type that I, I found in, in connection uh, with uh, Australian languages was what I called lost wax as a process of repair. Now lost wax as a way of, of doing um, bronze sculpture. What you do is you create molds. You have an inner mold and an outer mold and in between you've got some wax that's in the shape of the thing you're trying to make. And then what you do is you pour molten bronze into the cracks and it drives out the wax and then the bronze hardens and then you pull the molds out and you've got your, uh, your structure. The reason that, that metaphor was interesting to me was because in these Australian languages you have what we call a direct inverse system. What that means is that you have a subject and object marking in the verb, subject and object agreement. You have, uh, but instead of having the subject here in its slot, now all the different subject possibilities, and another slot which has the object markers. Uh, instead, you have a linear order that's determined by uh, pronominal hierarchy. So first and second person always comes first, and then third person human, plural, and then third person human, singular, and then the various non-human classes. So you don't know just from the, the just from the position of the pronominals which one is the subject and which one is the object. So what you do is you put a morpheme called the inverse morpheme in between the subject and the uh, in between the first element and the second one. If the first element is the object and the second one is the is the subject. So if it's me and then him here. If that means I, I saw him or I did something to him, nothing happens. If it means he did something to me, it's going to be I inverse he uh, and then the rest of the, of, the, of the verb. So this is a critically important relational morpheme. This is a morpheme that you can't do without because if it disappears, you have massive confusion as to what subject and what is object. Well, in some of these languages, uh, the inverse morpheme was, in fact, attrited, and uh, it was, a, in some cases, it was a nasal, and then it would be zeroed before another nasal, and so there was really a problem uh, that was looming. And what the language did was it found another morpheme that had a syllable shape and occurred in a, in, in, as an, a kind of epithetic context in a very limited range of, of, of forms on the, on the edges of this inverse system. And it got, a, it got a foot in the door in one of these uh, combinations and then it spread like wildfire through all of the, uh, of the inverse combinations. So you end up with a very productive... So you saved the system while replacing the key, the, the, the absolutely essential morpheme being replaced throughout uh, by this uh, other morpheme. And this must have happened uh, before the old morpheme was totally dead. It must have happened while the old morpheme was still visibly present in at least a subset of those combinations. So it was a repair. It was not something where you 
the system collapsed and then you started it all over again and you rebuilt it up from scratch. It was a repair. It, was a, it showed how important it was for speakers of this language to keep that system going even under the threat of, uh, of attrition. So that's another, another way to do it, not involving phono same consonants or anything like that, but the same basic principle. Now, in, in the Moroccan case that I'm talking about, if you know anything about Arabic, you know that vowel length is very important, grammatically and lexically. So, for example, you make a participle out of the verb by lengthening the, the, the ah vowel. Um, you uh, various plurals are, are, are expressed by with long vowels. It's very important in the in the morphology as well as in the basic lexicon. Now, when Moroccan Arabic first came into into northern Morocco, and you had uh, people speaking late Latin, and you had only a few uh, 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 Arabized Berber uh, soldiers holding the fort for the Arabs. You had, a, you had a situation where the substratum pronunciation could dramatically affect the, uh, the pronunciation of Arabic. And that's what happened. And at the time, late Latin, like early Romance, had long since lost vowel length distinctions from, from early classical Latin. And so uh, the vowel length disappeared in, um, in the, the oldest forms of Moroccan Arabic. Now, that sets off a whole set of of changes, particularly in in verbs. I don't won't go into the details, but it, it led to a, a dramatic restructuring where what you end up with is uh, a, a kind of crazy uh, identity of one half of the perfective paradigm with the imperfective paradigm, leaving the other part of the perfective paradigm by itself. We're talking about the form of the verb itself before um, uh, pronominal endings, and it's it's because of the, of the the flattening of the distinction between short u and long u and between short e and short and long e, <clears throat> and the result is to create artif artificially or secondarily or by accident a uh, homophony between the imperfective and part of the perfective paradigm, and then this pattern spreads to other cases where there was no. Uh, historical reason for that uh, change to happen. Just that that became the pattern that the uh, the, the uh, imperfective uh, for all categories and the first and second person perfective, that's now a, a morphological unit. And then the third person perfective is a different one. And that spreads uh, throughout the verbal system. So this is not so much a repair because it doesn't really um, it doesn't really solve any, any functional problems, but it's an example of a reorganization that is triggered by, accidentally, by a, uh, a, a phonological system. Anyway, I think you can gather from, um, from the comments I've made that I don't, I, I don't have much use for extreme forms of grammaticalization theory. I think that in many cases, uh, what's really happening is not that you have a, 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 a syntactic uh, construction that has a kind of built-in destiny to contract and move into the grammar and push some, some older incumbent construction out of the grammar without any reference to what's around it. I'm much more interested in historical processes that are conservative in nature rather than unnecessarily disruptive in nature. I'm talking about grammatical changes, not phonological. And uh, where the, the system, the incumbent system, brings things in selectively to keep itself going. So it doesn't just get bombarded with uh, new constructions barging their way into the grammar. Rather, the, the, the native system uh, 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 the speakers of the language have a lot invested in that uh, in that native system, and uh, they they work hard to keep it going. So my general philosophical approach is that historical linguistics, with the exception of the language contact phenomena, but if if languages are left on their own without socially disruptive uh, phenomena happening involving other languages. They're going to they're going to 
uh, be fairly similar um, from one point in time to another, even when a lot of the uh, the actual grammatical morphemes have been have been reshuffled. And so I I'm, I I, uh, I think I understand what Edward Sapir was getting at when he thought uh, when he said long ago that uh, languages the pattern of a particular language family could be distinctive even when the morphemes have been replaced by other morphemes. He was thinking of cases like Algonquian and uh, the uh, the California languages that are related to it. He was thinking of things like Athabascan. And he was looking at the he was thinking about how uh, you get these patterns which uh, keep going even as the uh, the uh, the superficial details uh, vary. Now, recently, I have I I used I used to think that a lot of this was about functionalism. I used to think that repair was something because when you had these disruptive forces, uh, it, it meant that there was going to be ambiguities and, and, and so forth. And that was really what the repair was all about. I, I have lately begun reconsidering that, although I still think that, that where there are, uh, there's, there is a threat of significant uh, ambiguity, that, that's, that that is enough to, to induce speakers to repair the grammar. But I've I've been reading uh, all this work about simplification and uh, uh, and co complexification of languages, and um, I've been reading the work of people like uh, like uh, Treadgill and McWhorter and so forth, and they've partially convinced me that uh, elaborate morphological complexity is kind of decorative. Uh, it isn't really necessary for conveying messages that speakers are also um, uh, David Gill uh, who points out that um, you don't really need much grammar to get your meanings across as long as the speaker is coming from the same uh, um, uh, place that you are. And uh, that has made me reconsider the idea that repair uh, in historical linguistics is primarily about saving the ship from sinking. Um, uh, it might simply be, at least in some cases or to some extent, that it's just really a matter of, of habit. That is that speakers, new speakers come into the world and they learn the language of their, uh, of their parents and their elders and they acquire habits of, of, of speaking, and that as, as these phonological disruptive effects happen, uh, they disrupt the, uh, the way you have learned to speak. Uh, they don't necessarily cause massive miscommunication or ambiguity that gets you into trouble or um, causes people to drive off cliffs and so forth, but uh, that it, it, is, it just disrupts the way you're, you are used to speaking and the people around you uh, have, have been speaking. So that it might be that repair is something that's going to happen even with forms of morphology that aren't really critically uh, essential, but that are just the way we've, uh, we are, are used to speaking. And that would be a different kind of uh, way of looking at uh, at conservatism, that it isn't just about fighting to maintain the uh, integrity of language as a communicative system, but it's um, it's a way of fighting to maintain uh, the the styles of speaking that we are used to.